Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Good morning, Cynthia. Good morning. Bonnie. Bonnie. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, I love to see those names pop into the chat because before they do, it just has a little uh, placeholder message that says, it's lonely in here. <laughs> so when your names come in and your smiling faces, it's, no longer it's, lonely. it's not lonely anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we are studying in Psalm 74. Psalm 74. Does God's anger smoke? against us. In this chapter, Asaph speaks prophetically of a time when Jerusalem is burned by fire and the temple is totally destroyed. His language suggests that he thinks that God has allowed this to happen and he goes on to cry out for God's mercy for the people. He mentions several times that he intends to put God in remembrance of his promise. And I mean, I know God is, is very old, but does that mean he's gotten forgetful in his old age? Uh, is it disrespectful to remind God? In this psalm, we learn how to pray when all hope is gone and the hand of God is seemingly delayed to act in our behalf. Good morning, Danielle and, and Alana and Pamela. God bless you. For those of you that may be listening uh, differently than what we have in front of us, there's a little chat box. If you look around, you can find it uh, where you can pass notes in church. <laughs> as long as you stay on topic. As long we as ask. we stay on topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we'll begin, and it starts out saying this is a maskal of Asaph. <laughs> and a maskal, there are, I think, 13 maskal psalms that are they're teaching something. It's a teaching or an instructive, a didactic psalm. Uh, here's a little extra credit. Somebody come back in here tomorrow and type up what the Didache is. You go do some research on the Didache and come back and tell me what that is uh, tomorrow. It's one of my favorite early church documents. I'll give you a little, little hint. It actually predates the book of Mark. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, which was the first book written that was the earliest book written that became a part of the New Testament canon, the Didache. Uh, Psalm 74, it's 23 verses. If you begin, Kitty, by reading the first nine verses, thank you. I will do it, lovey dovey. Sister, Sister Honey, sweetie. <laughs> right, lovey, Reverend honey Miss Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> Miskel of Asaph. O oh God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Remember the congregation which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion wherein thou hast dwelt. Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up their ensigns for signs. A man was famous, according as he lifted up axes upon the thick trees, but now they break down the carved wood thereof um, at once with axes and hammers. They have cast fire into the sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They said in their hearts, Let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet, neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. Now, you notice that this psalm starts out and it's describing the destruction of the temple, the burning of the city, uh, the demolishing of synagogues in the land. Well, there's only one problem with that. There were no synagogues in Israel until Nehemiah and Ezra's time. So what's going on here? And it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a mystery. Okay that uh, he would write this because remember Asaph served during David's rule and Solomon's rule. That was like the golden age 
of Israel, and they ruled everything all the way up to the Euphrates uh, River. I mean, they dominated uh, uh, the landscape. And it, Jerusalem, the silver was piled up in the streets, the corners of the streets. It was so abundant that it had very little value. And uh, so what's what's going on here with, mm. with Asaph? Uh, this psalm is uh, attributed to Asaph, uh, but its content suggests to some that it's not the Asaph that was appointed by David. And the reason for this, listen carefully, is because it does describe the destruction of the temple, which has no corresponding event in David or Solomon's time. Uh, some think that this psalm refers to the destruction of the temple at the beginning of the Babylonish captivity, which this happened then. Still others believe it was the persecution during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, Christian scholars look at this as a psalm indicating the foreshadowing of the, <laughs> you go, Zach, uh, <laughs> the persecution of the church in uh, the latter days. Uh, we'll stop and talk about the Didache just for a second. Uh, it was an early church document that was passed around. It was like a set of crib notes that was passed around among the early churches uh, addressing certain aspects of uh, conduct, principles of proceeding and gathering together. And uh, I would encourage you to go uh, find it. It's available in many, many places on the Internet. Download it, print it out, and read it. As It was like a set of guidelines. We might call them bylaws for how church was done in the first century. It's very, very Interesting, and again, it predates even the Gospel of Mark, which was the earliest canonical book that was written. And so it's it's really worth worth Good studying. Good job, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> now, in suggesting that Psalm seventy four was not written by Asaph, who was a contemporary with David and Solomon, well, hold on just a minute. We can't leave out the possibility that the psalm was written by that Asaph under the inspiration of the spirit of prophecy. See, the assumption that it was written, and you got to get this when you study the commentators, theologians, uh, they'll make a statement, they'll say, uh, well, when was this written? And without explaining why they believe so, they will say, well, it was written during this period. And the reason they say that is because it describes events that by the time they say it was written had already transpired. And the reason they do that, because there's a presumption of, of rejecting prophetic inspiration. They absolutely rule out that this could have been the original Asaph looking forward by the spirit of prophecy and describing events so accurately that scholars later on said, well, this was written after the temple was destroyed. There's no way it was written before because... Uh, they, they won't even consider that it was prophetic revelation. Uh, the assumption that it was written later uh, arises from the, the leaning, the pen chant of scholarship to reject prophetic inspiration. This is the case regarding, for instance, Jewish scholars of Jesus' time and theologians in our day that reject the book of Daniel as inspired because it was too accurate to the times and it simply couldn't, in their view, have been written before the days of Alexander the Great. The book of Daniel so accurately describes the rise and fall of Alexander the Great that scholars will just make a glib reference to say, well, this was written after Alexander's time. Why do you believe that? Because it has a date on it? No. They believe it had to be written after Alexander's time because it's too accurate and there's no way they're saying that it was a pseudo-prophetic document in that they're saying that the writer was masquerading as a prophet, pretending to foretell events that had actually transpired long after they believe that it was written. Do you see the despicable attitude they have toward the prophetic? And in fact, after Jesus was crucified and the early church was established, uh, you can study uh, Jewish history contemporary with the second century, and you'll find that they there was like a shakeup uh, regarding the Hebrew scriptures whereby they went in and they decided that Daniel no longer belonged in the, in the Jewish canon because they could not reject Jesus and accept Daniel. 
If they accepted what Daniel said, they had to accept that Jesus was the Messiah that they had crucified. Mm -hmm. So uh, rather than admit that they crucified the Lord of glory, they decided that Daniel was pseudepigrapha. It was was, um, not inspired and did not belong in the canon. My goodness. And so you you have to kind of get how the and you when you read these notes in the margins of your Bible, you have to when they start dating things and like they'll say this was written in the second century before Jesus, but it was depicting events that happened six hundred years before Jesus. The reason why is not because there was a date. It is not because they carbon dated a manuscript. It's because they're saying well, there's no way this could have happened because they absolutely reject the idea of prophetic inspiration. So we see in verse 1, the circumstances described by Asaph led them to conclude that God had withdrawn himself from them. You know, there are abysmal seasons in everyone's life that it feels as though God cannot be found. I've had some of those myself. Sure. If you've lived your life uh, any length of time, had some experiences, you've had those as well, abysmal seasons. <laughs> uh, we are tempted to believe during those times, God, are you mad at me? I, I remember, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was a pastor. Being a pastor, a full-time pastor, was pretty much my first adult job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had been in the military. When I came out of the military, the first thing I did is uh, I I had some odd jobs, but I went just very quickly into full-time ministry. And I loved the ministry. I made great sacrifices to get into full-time ministry. My dad said, get into full-time ministry. Don't ever look back. I loved full-time ministry. And then I pastored my second church, which is even more successful than the first. And We went from 18 people to 350 people uh, in that uh, congregation in the early days of that church. And then uh, I was contacted by the head of a denomination my dad had been a part of years past that uh, through a set of circumstances, they offered me a position and I became the number two man in a small denomination of about 900 churches worldwide. And I was at the, t- forgive me for putting it this way, but I was at the top of my game. I was at, the, as far as a clergy career, I, I had, I, I, here I was quite young, was in my early 30s, and I was, I was moving on and, and quickly rising. And they had made it plain when this denomination hired me that the founder was ready to retire, that they were grooming me to take his place. They felt like I was the guy to do all of that. And uh, and then uh, through a set of circumstances, the Lord spoke to me, and here I am at, at the top of my of my career, um, the trajectory of my career. The Lord says, "I want you to leave here." I'm like, "What are we talking about? Here? <laughs> what do you, you know? Uh, uh, leave? Why? Why would I leave? Why should I leave?" And the Lord just prevailed on me, and He confirmed it through a prophet that it was God's will for me to resign this uh, position I had. And I said, okay, well, uh, here I am the, participating in the headship of a denomination. There were two churches that were open and needed pastors, and they were what I call plum churches. They were very good churches, um, healthy congregations. I said, well, can I take one of these? Because I just assumed I'd been a pastor my whole life. All I wanted to do was pulpit ministry. And the Lord said, no, you can't take either one of those. <laughs> oh, well, what am I supposed to do? I want you to go to this little town in, in um, Missouri, in Henry County, Missouri, open a business and, uh, and do that. And I'm like, okay. I unmistakably knew it was the Lord. He confirmed it by a prophet I hadn't seen for five years uh, through an interesting set of circumstances. And so I did it. But here was the problem. I got into the business world, but I still had this fire in my belly for the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I was successful in the business world. I learned a lot. Much of what I preach day in and day out comes out of things I learned in the business world walking with God. But in the midst of that, I had this fire in my belly and I'm saying, fine, God, if you want me in the IT business, I'll be in the IT business. But what about this fire in my belly? I know that the callings of God are without repentance. I felt like God was mad at me. 
I thought I had done something wrong, that he had sidelined me, that he had shelved me because somewhere, somehow, I took a wrong turn and I wound up ejected from the ministry. And all he wanted to do was train you for the IT so you could put <laughs> us online one day. <laughs> well, I learned, and see, and the other part of that was during that time, I had been exposed to the prophetic. My father had been all the way back to the days of William Branham, so I knew what the prophetic was. But it was during that time I spent 15 years in business, and here I had been a denominational official. I could pick up the phone and get any minister to speak into my life that I wanted to because I held the keys to the kingdom of getting them into churches where they wanted to hold meetings. After I got into business, they wouldn't even take my calls, and I needed to hear from God. And I worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. I couldn't get in my car and go to cross country to this meeting, that meeting, because there was just me running this business in the beginning. And so I had to figure out how to get a hold of God and to get a word from God I could stake my life on without anybody's help. While I'm sitting there doing websites and doing IT work, well, do you see how God, like Kitty said, was absolutely training me for what we do now? But I thought he was mad at me. And so here's Asaph, you know, he's prophesying, he says, you're going to think I'm mad at you. But God wasn't mad at me. He was preparing me. It's like I remember my second church, I had this massive vision, and I was, I was promulgating the vision, I was casting the vision, and this is what we're going to do. And the Lord would just lean over and whisper in my ear, said, I'm not going to do that here. <laughs> I rebuke you, devil. Oops. <laughs> and so... Sometimes you just wonder, God, what do you think of me? Asaph, in his uh, prophecy, he describes the people thinking that they've been counted as sheep for the slaughter. You know, there are four references to this in the scripture about God's people being counted as sheep for the slaughter. Two of the references apply to God's people who are regarded by the forces of Antichrist as worthy of torture and death. The remaining two verses apply directly to Jesus, who suffers in our place, being led to the cross as sheep, to the slaughter. Uh, listen, it may feel as though God is aloof from us at times, but we are never far from his heart. Amen. He is near to us even at times we cannot sense his presence or see his hand in our situation. Kitty and I get involved in discipling relationships <laughs> where people have no idea why they're undergoing the pressure they're undergoing, but I know from looking at the fingerprint of God on their life, I know he is doing for them what he did for me when I spent 15 years in business. Yeah. He was preparing them, but they don't want to hear that. They want to know what their compensation package is. They want to know, they, they want out from under the very thing that's the answer to the prayer. They're praying for an outcome, but every outcome has a process connected to Amen. it. And they want to circumvent the process and get outcome. It's like, don't give me uh, the uh, green beans and sweet potatoes. Give me the ice cream. But, you know, you have to... Uh, commit, yield to God's process in order to arrive at outcome. And so when you're praying for outcome, God answers a prayer for outcome by inducting you into a process that can be very uh, filled with pressure. It's not comfortable. It's not convenient. But it's, you know, it's like the Lord says, I'm trying to answer your prayer. Would you please quit wiggling? Work with me now. <laughs> In verse to Asaph puts the Lord in remembrance of his people. Now, is it acceptable? Is it an acceptable way to pray to put God in remembrance? Does God need reminding? Does he have like onset dementia? No. You know, he's just a little bit addled and we have to remind him, right? No. Is he forgetful? In Genesis 8 1, we see God remembered Noah was in the ark and oh, 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 that's right. I got <laughs> I got that guy down there bobbing. <laughs> In that ark with all them animals. I, I, I was sorry, Noah, I was just preoccupied. No. Was, but yet he remembered. In Genesis 19, 29, God remembered Abraham when he was about to overthrow the city of Sodom mm -hmm. and negotiated with him for the life of Lot. In Genesis 30, 22, God remembered Rachel and opened her womb to bear a son. Mm -hmm. In Isaiah 43, 6, God speaks directly to us an instruction that we should put him in remembrance concerning his promises. The point is not that God forgets, 
but there is something in our prayers that activates his promise according to our faith when we remind him as it were. See, outside of active prayer, the promise of God becomes inert in our life in a way that causes us not to experience the blessing and the favor of heaven, even though it's available. How many of you know you've got mountain moving faith? Absolutely have mountain moving faith. But that mountain moving faith becomes inert if it is not mixed with the activity of expectant prayer that oftentimes is is intended to be delivered as a reminder. I remember this kind of prayer is really what launched us into this ministry when we prayed through the entire Psalms. And I prayed, I took that Psalm, I'd read Psalm 1, I said, God, if this doesn't apply to me, I'm taking it out of my canon. (laughs) <laughs> because I didn't want to have a chapter in my Bible that I couldn't say would accrue to me. And I prayed through every single psalm, and I prayed sitting on third floor balcony, people going in and out in the parking lot below, kitties bowing her head, <laughs> while I'm arguing with God about the canonicity of the chapters of psalm that I was not experiencing. See, what was I doing? I was reminding God at the end of 150 days, God pulled the, the rip cord or pushed the ejection seat and catapulted us into what is now a worldwide ministry. Mm-hmm. So, yes, it is acceptable. It's commendable and it's helpful to put the Lord into remembrance of his promises that he's made in our behalf. Verse 8 sums up the persecution of the wicked against the people of God The Antichrist spirit says, I'm going to destroy the people of God altogether till there's nothing left of the witness of God in the earth. You know, you can see that throughout the world today. God's people, how does it feel to be marginalized? Do you enjoy that? You you look in the world scene today and how Christians are just poo-pooed. They're just, oh, you're just not very sophisticated, you simpleton, you. Mm-hmm. believing in in God even the bastions of conservative philosophy and po- politics in the earth today whenever they really get down to it talking about the things of God you'd be stunned how they reject the very fundamentals of the faith because they don't want to be seen as not with it not sophisticated not intellectual or academic enough and God's people are increasingly being marginalized and rebuffed in the public square. Well, imagine the first century church with Nero uh, burning Christians to light his garden parties. And isn't it interesting that they were not an activist church? They were not an insurgent church. They just prayed Mm -hmm. and they died. And Mm -hmm. by how they prayed and how they died, they brought the known world to its knees at the foot of the cross within three generations. Mm -hmm. Who's listening? Mm -hmm. Government organizations and programs today are insisting, uh, isn't it interesting, they're insisting that false religions and ungodly lifestyles be accommodated and considered as protected behavior, all the while suppressing and penalizing sincere Christians in the practice of their faith, driving them out of their businesses, causing them to go through re-education programs. In the Soviet era, behind the Iron Curtain, that was called a gulag. Mm -hmm. You think people are not substantively uh, suffering in the United States by the, this posture of the world demanding accommodation to false religion and alternative uh, lifestyles while at the same time requiring those with Christian conservative values to be penalized simply for that. But recently, Iowa, the state of Iowa, put out a, uh, a mandate. They said uh, to churches, if you speak against the LGBT lifestyle, We're going to penalize you. That's breaking the law. We're going to go after you with fines and with litigation. And uh, and nobody said a word until finally a pastor just said, hold on just one minute. And he took him to court. Oh, no, that we never meant that in the first place. But it was the plain language that had been made available to the enforcement agents whose responsibility it was to identify these what they considered prejudicial uh, policies of not-for-profit corporations and to penalize them for doing so. But yet in their language, they didn't say, oh, we shouldn't have done that. They say, no, you just misread because you're too simple to understand what we were actually trying to accomplish. Hmm. 
See, the Lord told me years ago, my dad had a vision of churches being firebombed throughout the United States. That has certainly happened. And I asked the Lord about that. He said, persecution's coming to the United States. I said, how will it come? He said, through the courts. And isn't that exactly that, that very time, back in the, back in the 80s, I remember that week of a pastor in Colorado Springs who was conducting a house church was thrown into jail because he was conducting house church because it was contrary to the covenants and whatever it was in the subdivision where he was living. And this was long before anybody heard anything about Sharia law or anything like this. See, what, what are we supposed to do? What is to be our response? Asaph sets the example for us. Politics will not save us. Listen to me. The next charismatic, narcissistic political candidate will not save us. Zechariah 4, six tells us that it's not by might, it's not by power, and you look those words up and it means military might or political power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord that the impossible is accomplished and God's people are defended and remain strong in the earth. Verse 10 through 17, please. Okay. O oh God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? How long? How long, O oh Lord? Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out of thy bosom. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou de uh, didst divide the sea by strength. Thou breakest the head of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the head of the Leviathan 17. in pieces and gavest him to be meat for the people inhabiting the wilderness. Thou uh, didst cleave the foundation and the flood, thou driest up the mighty rivers. The day is thine, the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou shalt sell all, O set, all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. He talks about God is going to break the heads of Leviathan. What's Leviathan? You know, there is a spirit of Leviathan mm -hmm. in the earth. Job said that Leviathan is the king of all the children of pride. One of the things that I, I've noticed watching the political scene for during the course of my adult life, and I've noticed that to apologize for an American politician to apologize is political suicide. That uh, politicians, they will come up with all kinds of convoluted, twisted excuses and explanations rather than admit they are wrong and apologize because if they apologize, you can guarantee whatever political cycle they're in, they're going to come out the losers. Why? Because their Leviathan is at work in the political system. It says his scales are his pride and no air can get in between them, Job said. And the word air is pneuma, no spirit. The Spirit of God cannot penetrate him. His scales are his opinion, his opinions, his viewpoints. And it's like you get around people who they're not listening to a word you say. They're just waiting for you to take a breath uh, so that they can get, come back at you with what they have to say, not once entering into a dialogue, but just two people talking at each other rather than talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And isn't that what ha what's happening in the political scene? And you look at the, the Republicans and the Democrats, there, there was a day that they worked together more than they do now. Through some of the most difficult times we've seen in my lifetime during the 60s and the counterculture revolution when uh, there were those in Washington who sincerely believed that we were looking at the specter of civil war in this country because of what was happening during the 60s and uh, during difficult uh, seasons of the Vietnam War, but yet as much as there was, uh, they were not getting along, you put enough pressure on those political parties and they came together. But it, it's, they're incapable of doing that today. They're rendering, why is that? Is because Leviathan is king of all the children of pride. And look what it says, God will break the heads of the children of Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And what that means, you think that we're going to uh, uh, lobby Washington and using political influence are going to change hearts and what? No, it's the Spirit of God that knows how to bring 
this country into a posture of humility not to punish. Because the scripture says that God dwells in the high and lofty place with him that is of a humble and a contrite spirit. God wants to bless him. He's trying to posture us, not to denigrate us, but to posture us into a place of blessing to deliver us from pride that does not serve us. So in verse 10, Asaph prays that the, that the prayer that comes to all of our lips at one time or another, how long, O Lord? He said, God, you've got, you know, uh, your, you pluck your hand out of your bosom. You know, that's like you get around somebody and they think you're going to ask for money and they got their hand on their wallet, you know, because they don't want you. It's like, take your hand off your wallet. God, don't you know I need your help? <laughs> How long, O Lord? And then he begins to remind the Lord of his greatness in creation. And he speaks of deliverances of times past and asks the Father to lift his hand and act in the current crisis as he's been known to act before. God, you did it before. We want you to act now. And it reminds us of the prayer of Gideon in Judges 6.13. Now listen. And again, this whole, you could almost look at this psalm as being kind of insolent. You know, because it's a charge. God, how come you're beating us up? God, how come you're ignoring us? God, how come uh, you are folded your hands and refused to act in our behalf? It seems as though it's kind of insolent. But let's read the book of Judges 6, 13, and 14. Gideon, the angel appears to Gideon, and he says, um, Oh, my Lord, if, if the Lord be with us, then why? Why is all this befalling us? And where's all the miracles which our fathers told us of? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the the Lord has forsaken us and he's delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. And Midian means strife and contention. (laughs) Well, we could just dwell on that a while, but we won't. And the Lord looked upon him. Now listen, the Lord didn't backhand him. The Lord didn't give him the fivefold ministry. (laughs) Notice what, it's like the Lord was somehow pleased in, with Gideon's response. And he looked at him, he says, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? There was something about the transparency and the honesty of Gideon's response that got God's attention. So that's good. You're remembering. You're reminding me that that, that tells me you're remembering. Mm-hmm. So the prayer of Asaph and the prayer of Gideon above, it's not a prayer of unbelief. There's something very powerful in praying to God in transparency and honesty of heart. The Father says to us in our extremity what he declares to Gideon, Go in this thy might. I was waiting for you to flex your spiritual sinews. I was waiting for you to quit feeling sorry for yourself. I was waiting for you to to get rid of all that twisted theology that makes you think. It's like the Jews told Jesus, we've never been in bondage to any man. And they had the jackboot of Rome in their neck and claiming they were free. (laughs) And so finally Gideon and Asaph, they're just, we're not going to shellac this. We're not putting lipstick on this pig anymore. How come God? And God says, good, I was waiting for you to get to that point. Now we're prepared to see something happen. Amen to that. Verse 18 through the end of the chapter, please. Somebody interpret that. Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached, O Lord, and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. O deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove into the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. Have respect unto the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. O let not the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproached thee daily. Forget not the voice of thine enemies. The tumult of those that rise up against thee increases continually. So verse 18 continues the theme of putting God in remembrance. Now, I remember a two-year intercession initiative in the second church I pastored in Louisiana. We took a passage from Isaiah as our watchword in special prayer services we conducted for many months. And that passage was this, and we opened every single uh, 
uh, every single Tuesday night when we gathered to pray, we started with this verse, Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, that shall never hold their peace day and night. You that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence and give him no rest. Hold on. The watchmen are there not to figure out what the devil's doing. You are where your attention takes you. The watchmen are there are to give God no rest. It's like banging pots together. Bang, 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 bang. God, God, you're not sleeping, are you? Did I wake you up? I wasn't interrupting you, was I? God, give the Lord no rest. Keep not silence. Till, till what? Till he establish and make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And aren't you and I a part of the heavenly Jerusalem? Like mm-hmm. Abraham seeking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Amen. To let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Amen. See, the watchman on the wall is not there to watch or put the attention on the enemy, but to put attention upon the heart of God for his people. It may seem at times that's an adversarial prayer, but in fact, it's a prayer of desperation and humility, looking none other to God himself for answers. Like like David said, we've written these perverted hymns. I'll look into the hills which cometh. No, David was being scornful. Am I going to look to the hills where my help comes from? He was talking about the groves where the idols were being worshipped behind David's back. And he's letting the people know, I know those idols up on those high places. I'm not looking to the hills. I'm not looking to the grove of the idol, to those that are larger than life. That are because we've got a big problem, we need a big solution. Got to have somebody with a big personality. And it's getting to the point that our political candidates, they're caricatures. They're cartoons. They're, they're, they're so conflated trying to meet the expectations of the people because the people are trying to find something, a, a solution that portrays itself as bigger than the problems. And I got news for you. Uh, we serve a big God, and it's only the bigness of God. What are you going to do with a God like that? <laughs> Amen. It's God's bigness is the only thing that's going to solve our problem, that's going to meet our need. See, if we're watching, we're not watching for the next political Messiah Amen. to come into office and solve our problems. If the church should learn anything from the last 50 years, it's the fact that right, let me dial it down. <laughs> if the church should learn anything from the last 50 years, it's the fact that righteous <laughs> she laughing at, that righteousness and godliness in our land has never been brought about by political process. Right. We should be responsible citizens, yes, to participate in the process of government, but let us never forget. That is the hand of God and not the hand of man that brings about his purposes in the earth. And part of the hand of God being deployed is doing the Isaiah thing, putting him in remembrance until. It's what the old timers call praying through. I was reminded as I studied this about the prophetic word that came out in November of 2014. That there is coming a prayer movement into the earth that will rival in scope the way the early church prayed. That God said that there is going to be a movement among his people that they will pray in such a manner that the only comparative to the magnitude of prayer that will come forth into the earth, you'll have to go all the way back to the first and second century church. And the first and second century church, because of how they prayed, listen to me people, brought the known world to its knees at the foot of the cross. Mm-hmm. Completely plowed under a world power that was bent, hell bent on their destruction. Mm-hmm. Brought them to the point, put their foot in the neck of Rome and said, do you give up? Because of how they prayed and how they died. I know that doesn't fit the narrative of all of the alarmists out there that keep looking at the doom and gloomers like Charles Capps. They've seen some things, but how about looking at what God's doing in the earth? (laughs) The sky is not falling. The kingdom is coming. So, Father, we thank you for the psalm. Lord, we will 
remind you we're set as watchmen on the walls, not to tell somebody what the remind people what the devil's doing. We're set as watchmen on the walls that we would give you no rest. If it is possible to give you no rest, we're going to cause that to be uh, put into effect by our prayers, by our confident expectations, because God, we're not going to uh, lie down and idly acquiesce to what's happening in the earth. We're not going to look at what man's doing. We're not going to look to man as our Messiah. We're going to look to who you are and what you're doing. We're looking for a process that leads to outcome whose builder and maker is God and nobody's going to be able to take credit for what you bring forth into the earth, Father. And we say, your kingdom come, let the watchmen come forth of that character and that purpose. Oh, Father God, in the name of Jesus we pray. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 <laughs> Preachers on fire. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>